five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome back to the Ace Simulations channel. In today's video, we're going to be going over the very first flight of this rocket, Jank Squared. If you've not seen my first two videos in this series, I'll have them linked below, and you can also click it up in one of the corners. In those videos, I discuss the basic design overview, and why I made some of the design choices I did, and also what the purpose of this rocket actually is. So Flight 1 was a resounding success. The rocket reached an apogee of 1,006 feet, uh, which is pretty good. Um, the simulation was indicating 1,008 feet, so I'd consider that pretty darn accurate. And as we go through the data, we can also look at when these events took place and how the rocket sequenced each of them. The first flight flew on a Apogee Components F20-4. This is an ammonium perchlorate composite propellant, otherwise known as APCP, rocket motor. It has a burn time of 2.8 seconds and a total impulse of 64 seconds making this a really excellent motor to do a first flight on. So Jake Squared incorporates a complete avionics suite, you can see it in here, and that includes logging for altitude, temperature, humidity, uh, orientation, accelerations, um, literally anything you could possibly want, voltages, all that sort of stuff, and I can transmit it live down to this computer uh, using a custom ground station that I created. Unfortunately, for Flight 1, I didn't get to record that ground station data, um, however, for Flight 2 and 3 I did, so uh, in the future video we'll get to see what that actually looks like. All that flight data is transmitted live through an antenna located right in here on the rocket. I have some more details about that in my previous videos and the specific uh, transmitter that I ended up going with. The rocket contains a 9 degree of freedom IMU, as well as an altimeter uh, combination that has a barometer, temperature, humidity, and a couple other sensors. So that combined with the IMU gives me a ton of different data points that I can look at after the flight. I also record the state of the flight computer as well as its voltage throughout the flight so I can analyze it post-flight to make sure everything's functioning correctly and there's no short circuits. Alright, so enough talking about the actual rocket, let's go look at some data. So when I get the rocket initially, this is the data that I get off of it. It's loaded to the micro SD card on the scent and it's not very, uh, really great to look at here. So what I do is I take all of this data and I spit it into this spreadsheet here. I calculate a bunch more data points and I also display everything in a whole lot of graphs. So we'll go over these individually, but there's uh, a lot of really great data to go over. So as the rocket flies, it's recording these data points at a 50 millisecond time step, uh, which comes out to about 20 Hertz. And we're recording all the data points basically from time all the way to the last acceleration point here, uh, which uh, the rest of these here are calculated after the fact. Um, but we record all these data points, we record 500 of them, uh, which gets us about 25 seconds of actively recorded flight time. And if we look at how many data points it actually is, it's about 7,500 data points. So a lot of really useful data to look at here. So we'll start off before the flight actually takes place. There's a couple checks it goes through. So I'm just basically making sure that the rocket is functioning correctly. If any of these are off nominal, it won't even go into data logging. It'll throw an error, which will actually be on this indicator light here. Uh, there's a couple different indicator lights and based on the flash patterns of those, I can know what the error is. Uh, so here we can see, obviously everything is gonna proceed nominally. And then we do have one error that happens with telemetry. Uh, which it's failing to send the packets. So this is completely normal and actually expected because as the rocket sits on the pad, not ready to fly yet, uh, the telemetry is powered off to save battery. Once we power that telemetry on, it's going to do a set on the altimeter and then you actually go into its pad idle waiting for launch state. So this is basically just while it's waiting on the pad, it's going to throw these errors. Um, and it's kind of cool though because you can see it's actually actively trying to restart and it'll give me some different uh, data packet values of what it's actually trying to do. 
I also spit out the apogee so we can see uh, a little over 1006 uh, feet and then also what the altimeter calibrated at so like I said when I power on the transmitter that's what will set the altitude and so it calibrated at 533 feet so we can see uh, when the rocket first starts we're in state one that's its pad idle uh, basically right when uh, flight is detected that's when it actually kicks off and starts calculating things that's flight two and then when motor burnout happens, that's going to shoot us into flight or, or state three. And you can see that happens right about here, which is, uh, it looks like 7.4. Oh, no, actually, this isn't motor burnout. This is Apogee. So Apogee was about 7.4 seconds into flight. We can actually look here at what motor burnout was. Uh, yeah, so if we look here uh, on the velocity, we can see that right around 2.4 seconds is where we start getting a more constant deceleration. And we can see that a little bit more clearly here on the acceleration, right around 2.4 seconds, which is basically exactly what was advertised because the uh, data logging kicks off just a couple of milliseconds after launch actually happens. So that's how we get the 2.8 second uh, burn uh, with this resulting uh, pattern here. So that's right exactly what we would expect. So one thing we'll look at is the raw altitude versus filtered altitude. So if we come over here, I can actually, I have it logged. So initially they're like pretty much identical. Um, you can see the differences. Uh, AGL basically is just using that offset, whereas filtered altitude is taking raw air density basically. So you can see with that, it was getting up to almost 1600 feet in terms of what the air actually felt like, but above ground level was that 1006 feet. But if we zoom in really close, I did it right here at about Apogee, you can see the common filter versus uh, the raw altitude data. So the raw altitude is the blue, and you can see it's got some jumps and spikes, especially right here, which isn't quite realistic. And so the Kalman filter basically goes in, anticipates that noise, and then it'll provide a much smoother graph. And the reason that's necessary is when we take the derivative of that, that's what actually gives us our velocity here. And we want that to be as smooth as possible, otherwise we get lots of noise, uh, similar to what you see here. And the reason that noise starts appearing is that's just that descent we're going to a much slower logging at that point. So talking about the Kalman filter, this is an old test flight I did. Raw altitude data is uh, lots of noise is incorporated into it. And what the Kalman filter is doing, you can see, is it goes through and it's smoothing out all that noise uh, because each spike we see is going to be reflected in that velocity. And that's going to give us a terribly inaccurate, really, really noisy velocity component. So by using this Kalman filter, it drastically smooths it out. And uh, we can look at a couple other flights. If we have an air, for instance, uh, here, or no, not here, uh, here, here we go. Um, if we have any errors, you can see the raw altitude data is got something going on. It's not accurate at all, but we see the Kalman filter still going to approximate what it should be. It incorporates a little bit of latency into the system, but overall this is going to be a much more accurate uh, look at what the flight is going to look like. So that's the benefit of using the Kalman filter. So we can look at a couple other uh, flight events here. So looking at the acceleration data, uh, this is the Z acceleration, so basically straight up and down. It's not sure how accurate it actually is because this should match pretty close, I think, to the motor burn or the motor thrust curve. We can see uh, right around that 2.4, 2.5, somewhere around there, uh, seconds in a flight is where we actually have motor burnout. And that makes sense also when we look at the velocity because we go to a constant deceleration at that point. We can also look at the acceleration data. We see that there's a pretty constant spike at the same point along here that's going to be the parachute ejection. And if we cross check that with altitude here, we can see that that's right at apogee. So the parachutes fired exactly where they were supposed to be. If anything, they fired a little bit lower than they were supposed to be. Uh, and that may have accounted for that couple feet lower than the simulation predicted. Okay, so looking at the orientations here, it's all recorded using Euler orientations. I'm probably going to move this to a quaternion based orientation system. Uh, when I go to an active control system with fins or thrust vectoring control. Uh, but we can see that our X orientation, which is essentially the pitch of the rocket, is very consistent. There's not a whole lot of uh, orientation change throughout the flight. Uh, of course, once we deploy the parachutes, that all changes. There's a lot more noise as the rocket tumbles around. Uh, the parachute is fixed between the two stages. 
So it's free to kind of flop around and we can see that reflected in this data here. Uh, we also see it reflected in the acceleration values here, all that noise. Y orientation, we can see that it does have a good bit of uh, change in its orientation. This is the natural parabolic arc. And the reason it jumps here, uh, that's 360, then it loops around back to zero. That's why we have to jump. If we normalize that, we would see this continue up and that's the expected parabolic arc as the rocket kind of tips over at the top. And we're almost pretty much flat level right when those uh, right at apogee, which is what we expect, and that's where we see the ejection charge fire. Z orientation is the roll of the rocket, and again, it's pretty darn consistent. It looks like we had a little bit of roll in one way, so my fins aren't probably perfectly aligned because we start picking up some uh, roll in that direction. If we look at some zoomed in uh, data of the uh, ex angular acceleration, or sorry, angular velocity, it looks like, yeah, it changes a little bit, so we do have a little bit of misalignment in the fins, not anything to be concerned with. Uh, we can see that for the most part it's right around zero for these. So we can look at the angular velocity uh, zoomed out over the entire period. It's like pretty much rock solid, but the reason this is a little bit not quite accurate is we have all these spikes in here from jumps and orientation uh, and all the noise while it's tumbling around, so these numbers aren't really very accurate. Uh, which is why then I did this further zoomed in section here. We can see all the noise, just completely useless data, but we can get a little bit better view into the controlled flight or rather stabilized flight with the fins and all of our rates are nominal. So one other thing to look at, we can actually look at this state machine here and we see that it starts out at one, the ground idle, and then we jump up to two once the launch is detected. We have then another state change when apogee is reached and then we see it just stays in state three. That's not actually entirely accurate. Uh, once we jump to state four, that's signifying we've loaded all 500 data points. So it's basically a constant 25 seconds of flight time. And what happens in state four is uh, all this data we've been logging to basically a giant, uh, a couple of giant arrays in RAM. Uh, and that's done just because it's a whole lot faster. And one of these videos, I'll actually look at why I did that in the software. We can look at um, all how I'm using each of the bytes I have within memory. Uh, but I have them all in a giant array in RAM. And so when it's in state four, it takes these arrays and actually puts them into the micro SD card. So you don't want to do that on the way up because the between vibration and the slower uh, write speeds of the micro SD card, you're at risk of losing valuable data. Points. So uh, once that's complete, I will see this on the ground station readouts, um, but when that finishes all the logging, it'll then jump to state five, and that's basically its recovery state. So it goes to a really, really slow logging, um, and it's basically just focusing on transmitting uh, some data so I can hopefully try and find the rocket. So we can see here, I have a list of all the possible values I can record, and you can see I'm only recording about half of them, a little, little over half of them. So some future flights, uh, I can record a bunch of calibration data, which would be pretty interesting, uh, just to see how calibration changes between flights. That might be interesting, just characterizing how accurate that IMU actually is. Uh, we have voltage and transmission time. Uh, I can also do like RSSI, which is basically signal strength between the ground station and the rocket. Um, but those are two values I didn't actually record. Voltage I have transmitted to the ground station, so I can monitor it for flight, uh, but I don't record that. Uh, also here, the X, Y, and Z, basically magnetic uh, interferences, uh, that, that's from the magnetometer, so I can get, uh, basically it's like a compass, I can get where true north is at the different orientations, uh, which when I combine together, I can characterize a really, really accurate orientation of the rocket relative to Earth, which would be really interesting, again, when I start doing some actual control systems. Temperature and pressure are two I also don't record. Pressure I use, I calculate the altitude using that, but I don't record the raw pressure. Uh, it comes off in mercury, uh, inches of mercury, but I calculate that into altitude uh, in feet. All right, so one other shot to look at is this ground track shot. Uh, it's unfortunately a little bit out of focus, um, but we can see ignition happen and in a really great track as the rocket goes off the rail, uh, we can see that frame. Uh, no aggressive uh, turning, nothing that looks out of sorts, and that agrees also with that flight data that we looked at. So we see it continuing on up, and then uh, we actually see chutes deploy uh, right there, and you can see 
It's very small, but you can see that shoot as it zooms in. Um, so we had good shoots right at Apogee there. Four, three, two, one. So this angle was taken from a little bit farther back, I have it slowed down here, and the tracking wasn't quite perfect, uh, but you can see that initial launch portion is really great, and also the color is great. So here's another shot, this is a GoPro Hero 10 mounted right next to the ground, and it slowed all the way down, uh, you can see that igniter fire very slowly there, the smoke starting to come out, and then as it actually ignites the motor you're going to get a big puff, which is right there. And then you have the rocket going off the rail really clean. And then you have all this debris shooting up into the camera. And that's all just a bunch of bark and dirt. I was underneath the launch pad. And then as the shot kind of continues, you have that debris starting to settle and all the smoke starting to clear. And it just looks really great when it's slowed down like this. Three, two, one. This is a really nice shot, even though it doesn't track the rocket great, you can really see that plume on liftoff. And right there we can see the parachutes actually deploy, which looks really great. So unfortunately there were a couple of small errors with the flight. Um, there were actually only two issues. Um, none of it actually with the flight data or any of the stuff I was trying to validate. Um, but when I was first starting to get ready for launch, it was delayed a good bit because the ground station wasn't receiving any data. That ended up being a procedural issue uh, where I have to have it connected, the actual computer connected to the internet so it can get weather data uh, in as part of its pre-launch checks. And I didn't have like a mobile hotspot turned on or anything for that. So uh, it was blocking the rest of the code being able to run and receive that data. So it's something I'm fixing in the code um, and it'll be resolved in uh, later flights and I've also updated procedures to make sure that I am in fact connected to the internet to get that weather data in. One other thing is as the rocket launched we actually see it jut off in one direction so it veers off uh, and every single flight I've done with this rocket it always veers off in one direction even back when it was first being launched as Janko uh, where it's just this first stage flying um, that also veered off at the I think it's down to the actual launch lugs I'm using so instead of using rail buttons I'm using these uh, basically little lugs that follow that launch rail and uh, because of that I think that's causing it to veer off once the top one clears and the bottom one's still attached. So in future rockets I'm going to make sure I use the rail buttons. I think it's just going to be a lot more consistent using that uh, and it looks a little bit better I think um, but most likely that's the cause of that. So overall I'm really happy with how this flight went. Uh, I'm looking forward to going higher and faster with this rocket and especially as I continue proving out these avionics. Uh, I can't wait to start doing some high power rocketry flights. So that'll, that'll be really exciting once that starts. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, consider leaving a like and subscribing. It helps me a lot. I do plan on doing more videos like this as well as my normal simulation content. So if any of that appeals to you, make sure you subscribe. If you have any questions about this rocket, leave them below. I read and respond to all of my comments. Uh, and I really am just looking forward to kind of putting out some more information about this rocket. I uh, will hopefully do a coding kind of deep dive into how the actual state machine works in the rocket. Um, that'll be pretty interesting. It'll be high level kind of engineering, but if that's something that interests you, uh, you know, stay tuned for that. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll catch you guys next time. See ya.